Yeah. Cool. All right, guys, thanks for joining us out here today. Um, my name is Tommy Neubauer. Uh, I work for Citrix as a uh, network uh, sales engineer. And um, so today we're going to jump down the rabbit hole of how to pick the right uh, architecture for um, microservices based application delivery. So we're going to talk a lot about um, the proxies and uh, what, what it is that, um, that that architecture looks like. Uh, so on the agenda side of things, we're going to go through the importance of choosing the right architecture, what the complexity looks like, um, kind of a quick recap of layer four versus layer seven load balancing proxies and um, you know, what, what that difference looks like. Four different options for architecture, um, the different levels of uh, complexity, where the learning curves are for each, ones, uh, each one of those, uh, what the benefits are. And then we're also going to kind of go into a deep dive of the seven different ap attributes that we've identified from a lot of our customers of what, um, what all of the different stakeholders are looking for. So you know, you've got DevOps engineers, SREs, application owners, you've got a whole bunch of people that, are, that have different um, attributes that they're looking for in the architecture, right? Different things that you need to be able to deliver uh, through that. And then at the very end, we'll kind of touch on Citrix uh, architecture and how we kind of address that. Um, but we're going to try to keep this as far out of the, the vendor space as possible. So the challenges of choosing the right proxy architecture. Um, so obviously, like we said, stakeholders are a huge piece of that. So you know, DevOps, SecOps, SREs, application owners, network teams, all of these guys are looking for different pieces uh, or different things to be delivered to them. Uh, and they expect it to, to just work and give you different levels of visibility or different flexibility in the network. Um, you know, so there's a whole lot of different pieces. Um, load balancing in, uh, in this architecture is really bringing in a whole new breadth to this space where traditionally we're used to thinking about north-south right it comes in hits the application hits the database and then comes back out with an answer right so in microservices based architecture we have services talking to each other in a lot broader spectrum than we're used to in monolithic applications that just wasn't the case you didn't have these services bouncing all over the place right so now we have to consider how do we load balance those how do we add visibility into all of those services because that can be a huge problem as somebody comes in and all of a sudden all the customer sees is you got that 500 error because what you've entered an email address wrong, but why as an application owner, if you don't know why your users are getting 500 errors, which could be very difficult in a microservices based architecture, who knows, maybe it wasn't the front end that puked on it, right? So now you need a lot more uh, visibility and you need something that's gonna bubble that up quickly. The trade-off between our uh, different architectures that we're gonna look at is gonna be kind of the benefits versus complexity. As you gain more visibility and more, uh, um, more benefits to these, these pieces, these architectures, you're gonna increase the complexity, right? We're, we're talking about a whole lot more data coming in and a whole lot more management. And of course, as you have more pieces that you can manage, the more difficult it can get. So there's different learning curves associated with this. Like I said, architectures are complex, and as we go into these microservices architectures, you're going to see how complex and deep that rabbit hole really can get. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, why, um, why there are different ways that you can jump into uh, lower complexity, uh, see fewer benefits, but then ramp up uh, and change those architectures over time. And of course, the rapid pace of architecture, of technology and open source innovation is grossly impacting this, uh, this space, right? Uh, so we need to be able to pick the right architecture so that we're not having to forklift everything anytime that we want to evolve. So to recap, layer four versus layer seven load balancing. Layer four of load balancing traditionally being your IP based, it has no visibility into the actual HTTP payload. It's not doing SSL decryption. It's typically just your IP versus IP and port based load balancing. 
So you, at this point, you don't get to do any of the fun things layer seven load balancing does as it decrypts that traffic. You can now start making advanced load balancing decisions based off from URL, based off from payloads in the requests, based off from payloads in the response, new cookie based persistence. You can do uh, you know, all sorts of different things to those sessions that you couldn't traditionally do if you were uh, layer seven blind. Um, of course, resource monitoring, layer four, you're talking about just being able to monitor the TCP stack. If you know TCP handshake works, great. On the layer four side of things, your hands off, right? You don't get to, you, you don't really get to see if there's a 500 error that comes back. You don't get to see you know, any of those, uh, those more advanced um, resource monitoring capabilities. You don't get to check the backend resources for is the page returning a 200 okay? Is it returning a certain uh, string in your payload? Um, all you get to see is just the TCP response. It, it either falls over or it doesn't. Um, and then of course, application security. So application security, you once again on the layer four side of things, you're not looking into is there a SQL injection that's happening? Is there something malformed with a SOAP request? Is there, you know, any of the web application firewall stuff goes out the window at layer four. Uh, at layer seven, now you get to start being a lot more granular about protecting your applications and then enforcing those policies that security wants uh, in place across the board. And of course, with layer seven and doing that on, on the proxy side of things, you'll get to see here in a second where we get to start enforcing that across the microservices. So here we look at kind of our architecture uh, choices. And you see we go from complexity going high, but also having high benefits for full service mesh. But we have two tier ingress, which has lower complexity, but also lower benefits. Unified ingress merges the two, uh, the two hops that traditionally happen um, with your ADCs. The service mesh light delivers a lot of the, uh, the um, benefits that service mesh has with a lower complexity, but there are going to be some visibility issues there. Um, so let's talk about our stakeholders real quick. With, you know, with this whole, with, with the business in general, right, we're going to have different uh, stakeholders that are involved. DevOps wants fast, uh, reliable releases. Right? They, they care about how many releases can I pump out on a regular basis. Um, you know, how do they handle releases? Is it canary deployments, blue-green deployments? That's what they're really focused on. So you have to pick an architecture that's able to give them rapid deployments, um, but they're not concerned about the same things as SREs are, right? Your site rel reliability engineers are sitting there worried about uh, um, being able to have visibility into the application. How, you know, how reliable is it? How can they do a post-mortem, right? So we need to get log aggregation. We need to be able to see what happened in any incident. Network ops, this, I feel like from my days in pilot, this was always fun because network operations to me always was the one that was um, uh, a little bit more cautious, I guess, uh, to approach things, right? You've, you're used to this standard data center model that you know, things, I put my firewall rules in and then and, and I'm done, right? Yep, exactly. And so now we've got DevOps over here going, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And DevOps over here is going, I want to change things 1,500 times a day. How do I do that? Um, we have two diametrically opposed stakeholders in this, right? Of course, DevSecOps is all about how do I get my applications as secure as possible. I um, like how you know, DevOps and NetOps are diametrically supported. <laughs> so are developers. Of and, yes. <laughs> hmm. Almost like that was done on purpose. I don't know. <laughs> and the poor flat platform team is sitting here in the crossfire of literally all of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This poor platform team is literally stuck <laughs> with how do I keep this thing floating in day two? How does my how does everything operate in day two? Because developers threw it over through the DevOps team, you know, snowballed through everybody else or steamrolled through everybody else, and it's now the platform team's problem. How do we how do we fix this? Right. 
like we said, everybody has unique and diverse needs. And somehow we have to pick an architecture that serves for all of those. So we're going to look at the seven key attributes um, in each one of these. And, and once we jump into the deep dive, you'll kind of see why we've talked about these seven key attributes as much, because they really are the parts that we're going to talk about solving for. And those architectures are, uh, are going to offer um, increasingly more benefits to, uh, to these attributes. So you know, application security, observability, continuous deployment, scale and performance, open source integration, and the Istio control plane is becoming uh, the, somewhat the de facto from what we're seeing as far as control planes for, uh, for Kubernetes and microservices based architectures. Um, and then of course, IT skill set required. So we've already talked about everybody trying to hire and you know, obviously this is, this is a problem. And so we haven't really touched on why that's a problem for IT skill set, but we all know that changing the way that the ship moves is very difficult. So picking that architecture is going to be critical because if you pick something that your organization doesn't have the skill set to adopt, uh, it's, it's not gonna happen, right? I mean, you're, you're gonna throw it out there and everybody's gonna go, sounds like a great idea. And then they're gonna turn around and walk away and not do anything, right? Um, so, We'll talk about two-tier ingress here for a second. So two-tier ingress is gonna offer great application security through for north-south traffic. But once we dump into uh, the Kubernetes and Kube proxy takes over, um, you end up with having no more visibility and control in your east-west traffic. So as your nodes talk to each other, the only thing that you can do is try to adopt something like Project Calico to uh, to gain control over that. Uh, if you want to try to manage that through a, a central control plane or even handle that through like, you know, SSL decryption and start doing more advanced policy sets, you need that to run through an ADC that can decrypt that and handle it, or you're going to end up spending a lot more uh, resources on your nodes trying to do that and a lot more cycles trying to get uh, your people to deploy anything like Project Calico or anything like that that can sit there and start decrypting that traffic and, and applying the policies you're looking for. And so it gets a lot more complicated for east-west traffic in, uh, or almost non-existent for east-west traffic. Observability in north-south is, is great, right? You've got your traditional ADCs piping all the counters out that they, that they gather, um, visibility into all that traffic. But once again, we have very limited visibility into what Kube Proxy is uh, sending out. It's going to be a couple of counters, and they really weren't they weren't developed to uh, to handle all of that advanced telemetry that you might be looking for. Continuous deployment. Once again, north south. This is really easy through the ADC, right? With ingress controllers, your ADCs uh, able to have those policies updated, um, but with east-west traffic, Kube proxy lacks uh, um, in, in some of its own limitations. Scale and performance. So this is kind of interesting. I, I was, um, I had originally heard about IP tables being some limit, limiting factors, which apparently is also the de facto way to deploy in Kubernetes, is everything deploys on IP tables. Um, that runs into scalability issues. Uh, there is IP v server mode, uh, which is possible to eliminate some of that. So there's just some additional complexity that comes along, along with managing microservices uh, and, and some kind of gotchas that can show up along the way if you go with just the default and leverage IP tables on the, on the node. Um, it, at first, it could look like everything's going to work great, and then all of a sudden you go and try to scale it out into production and it falls over and everybody goes, what happened, what happened to your environment? Um, and so I think we've, I don't know, I've definitely had those, those instances where it seems like, yeah, everything works great and dev, test and QA and then you throw it out in the world and what happened? Well, everybody decided to hit it too often. Um, and then of course, open source tool support. North, south, you've got Citrix ADCs or just really your ADCs in general should be able to do a great job of uh, integrating with Prometheus, Spinnaker, um, EFK, and be able to, to handle um, uh, you know, 
aggregating those uh, those counters and um, and the data that you're looking for. What, Cube, what is the uh, uh, elastic? Um, Probably Apollo uh, Beat and Kavana, but that's inaccurate because it wouldn't be. Well. No, I can't, yeah, I can't remember which one EFK is. It's I want to say that it's another one of the cloud. Um, elastic Surge. Yeah, I would yeah. say Apollo Beat is probably what they're doing because that's what sort of place log <laughs> They're going to go EBK because Beats is the whole the whole thing, not just file beat. Yeah, it's um, one of the CNCF projects, um, but I can't remember which one. If you look at the CNCF landscape, uh, you uh, if you go to landscape.cncf.io, like it's a really good place to overload you with what products are out there. Um, so. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm not 100% sure on what EFK is. Um, but then, yeah, uh, Cube Proxy has some limited support there as well. Um, on the Istio uh, Unified Control Plane, of course, your ADCs integrate with Istio and are able to leverage that as kind of your single source of truth. It's able to, it has plugins um, for Istio uh, whereas um, Cube Proxy is not Istio enabled. Um, and then, of course, this is where it becomes the easier way, right? Two tiered ingress, your traditional ADC owners, your network guys are owning their tier, able to operate at their, uh, their normal speed, uh, versus now you've got an, another ADC inside um, the Kubernetes cluster being controlled by your, uh, your DevOps engineers, and they're able to push whatever policies they want. They're basically operating completely separate from each other, right? Your traditional networking load balancing guys can move at their, you know, uh, traditional um, change management pace. Uh, I'll just leave that one where it lies, I think. Um, and then your DevOps guys can go push out whatever policies they need, and it becomes a lot more, uh, um, uh, fluid for them. So when we move up to unified ingress, this is where we, we get some benefits. Um, I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, where they put these? I'm a little bit like, eh, you waited. They, there were clearly some weighted opinions on what's better and what's more valuable. Um, so at this point, we collapse down into one ADC that's being managed by your platform team. Uh, so your platform team now needs to be somewhat uh, network savvy. So that's where our learning curve is going to come in um, for uh, for your platform team, or you're going to at least expect that they're a lot more uh, a lot more network savvy instead of training them up to it. Uh, the plus side is you drop a node, so you have one less hop, right? You don't have the internal ADC in the Kubernetes cluster anymore. Uh, the downside to that is going to be some of the visibility, right? Everything now just comes in through the ingress, dumps into uh, into the, the cube proxy, and we still have the same problems that we've had before with, with east-west traffic. Limited observability uh, in east-west traffic, lacks uh, support through Kubernetes limitations for, con uh, um, for continuous deployment. And when we talk about continuous deployment, I, I also want to call out that Cube proxy doesn't do a good job of uh, like blue green and canary deployments. It doesn't have a way of um, of waiting uh, services as it drain stops those. So there's there's a lot less um, yeah a lot less flexibility. Right, all of a sudden you're just going to turn it off, and if somebody was in the middle of a transaction, sorry, but that pod's dead now. Go try again. Well, not all applications like when all of a sudden a service goes dis and disappears on it, uh, especially if you're migrating to microservices based architectures uh, from a monolithic application and you're trying to rapidly lift and shift those applications. Um, you're you're going to run into problems uh, with with non traditional protocols and, and things like that, um, which we'll we'll touch on here in a second. Um, of course, scale and performance are, are very similar. Open source tooling integration. Once again, we've dumped we've dumped into the Kubernetes architecture, and whatever happens in East West, everybody kind of loses the level of visibility that we're used to. Um, there we go. Yeah. So the platform team needs to be uh, 
needs to be more network savvy. That's kind of the, the drawback to it right now. We expect more on our platform team. Um, service mesh. Uh, so this actually jumps us straight into kind of the, what everybody's shooting for, right? Everybody's shooting for this full service mesh, mesh architecture. Because at this point, we have a sidecar attached to literally every pod doing SSL decryption, uh, doing WAF policies, you know, setting up uh, really all the policies that you're used to sitting in our, uh, um, in, laser doesn't work on that, um, <laughs> on the white screen. Uh, so you know, we're used to enforcing some of these policies here at, at the front, but when that we start talking about a service mesh architecture, we move to having all of these services talking interconnected, all of a sudden what happens if one gets compromised? Now, theoretically, if you've done all your SSL decryption on the front end, on the ingress, everything's in plain text going between the services. You now have this, this huge security hole. Or say somebody accidentally goes and, I don't know, decides to start pulling credit card numbers from a service that shouldn't be pulling credit card numbers. Now we have no way of enforcing that between the pods, and we have to rely on the on on further end uh, services to take care of that for us. Um, so application becomes a concern with uh, with the sidecar being attached to those pods. Now we're able to do all of that offloaded from the pod onto the sidecar. Um, so MTLS, all of that authentication that can happen as well becomes enforced at the pod level. Um, observability, once again, now we're getting counters, right? We're getting counters from literally all of this. All of our telemetry is getting piped out. All of it's getting piped into Istio, um, Prometheus, Grafana. Everybody's aggregating literally every step that happens. So you can build out um, a service graph and actually start seeing who's communicating to who successfully. What does that look like? How many failures are happening? Maybe there's a service that shouldn't be talking to another one we can feed that back into um, a, a CI CD deployment tool like Spinnaker. So now if we roll it out and there's a canary deployment that happens, we start seeing 500 errors happen from a service. We can now roll that back very quickly. Um, and we've actually been, we've done a, a proof of concept on this with Spinnaker to go through and do deployments um, and, and actually see where failures have happened and have Spinnaker roll those deployments back automatically when the, we start seeing 500 errors. Uh, so this becomes really powerful when you start being able to get those counters that traditionally you wouldn't be able to get. Um, no, so that's, uh, I think the um, proof of concept was all done through uh, um, REST APIs with uh, Spinnaker and our ADM platform, um, which is the monitoring tool to all that. So it kicked off uh, alerts back to uh, Spinnaker. Spinnaker was aware of um, the, the failure at that point, rolled it back, dropped an alert into Slack, and you know, let, the, let the developer know, hey, by the way, your build failed. Uh, try again. Um, and of course, scalability, uh, it scales out in pretty much all the directions. Um, we do have a and see that happens in between the pods. So you do want to be a little bit careful with that because you've got additional uh, resources that are happening, right? With all of these counters um, and, and additional sidecars, that's, that's always going to be a concern. Um, so more CPU and memory will be required along this way. Um, open source tooling support. This is now an ADC across the board. Um, so Citrix, from, from the Citrix perspective, it's actually all the same code base. So it's one of, one of the things that, that we like is you don't have to worry about, you know, a competitor sitting up here and then something they recently acquired hanging out in here and trying to make it all work together. It's literally all the, uh, all the same. Um, so uh, open source tooling support is gonna be, of course, the same across the board. Um, and then, of course, Istio uh, Unified Control Plane is going to play well because um, it's the same. Uh, it, it's an ADC all the way through. Um, oh, uh, I did need to call out that 
Istio mixer, if you're leveraging that, it, um, it, can, it can become your bottleneck. Um, so as it starts doing policy enforcement, uh, it kicks all that traffic and requests out to um, the Istio mixer to check those policies whenever it sees a hit. Um, so you do want to be careful with uh, um, leveraging that, that piece. And then of course, for full service mesh, your IT learning curve can be steep, right? You're talking about leveraging some pretty advanced policies, um, very advanced architecture, architectural view um, of, of your microservices and, and architecture there. So this does not come easy or at, at a cheap cost. Um, so this is why we'll look at service mesh light. So this, at this point, we're not attaching a sidecar to everything, but we're routing all of our traffic, even from uh, east-west traffic, up to an ADC that sits, uh, that sits detached from those, but just as its own pod. Um, so this becomes uh, a lot easier to manage. Uh, now all of your policies for application security are still enforced between all of those pods um, in both east-west and north-south traffic. Your observability um, now, of course, is the same as service mesh continuous deployment is the same as well. Um, and then of course, scale up performance. We actually are able to scale this a little bit better because we take a hop away, right? We don't have the, the two ADCs sitting for east-west traffic. Um, we're not bouncing between those. And this is why when the, I say that our graph might be a little bit tilted, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, so this one's easier to deploy. Um, then full service mesh gives you a lot of the benefits, um, requires a lot less training, and is easier to migrate to from tier two. So tier two was our easiest architecture to, uh, to deploy, um, lacked some of the visibility, um, but this, this way you just change the deployment file and, uh, and are able to push that back out, and now you're gaining all of the benefits of uh, full service mesh. Um, yeah. Um, how do you, in the last architecture, like how do you kind of enforce that traffic to force all the pod traffic to go back to the? Yeah, so that's. The sidecar, like the sidecar kind of hijacks the, all the network stuff. So you can, I mean, when you're this external thing, how do you kind of yep. the pod level pull, make sure the pods go to the right place to send all the traffic? Yeah, my understanding is it's all done at the, um, it's done with RBAX and um, uh, in the deployment file. Um, I know that we've got it published on our GitHub page and uh, I'd actually, Heard that question before on from one of our other guys who's given uh, given the presentation and had that exact same question, um, and and I would have to get uh, our our PM team to to answer that. Um, they've yeah they've set up a demo for it. I personally haven't run through. <laughs> yeah, um, I've actually yeah on the on the Citrix side of things, I've seen them do something for this that I that they don't do with any other product that I'm aware of. Um, and that's that we have Slack channels set up for literally anybody that wants to plug this in. Um, we will set that up and PM and engineering will be on that Slack channel ready to help you with literally all of it. Um, and, and yeah, I haven't seen us do that with any other product. So um, it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, really the question is at that point, what, you know, you're asking yourself, what will your, your architecture really be? And it's, it's a matter of what fits best for your organization. Where does your skill set lie? If you have novices that haven't been, um, that haven't been in this space in service or in a, uh, a microservices based architecture before, two tier ingress is probably the simplest and easiest way to go ahead and get this started, uh, all the way up to doing full service mesh. Um, which to your point can probably enforce policies a lot better uh, with the sidecars, adds an extra hop of latency and adds complexity, right? Um, it's gonna hop the latency a little debatable because all that happens in the kernel. In fact, it doesn't actually leave, it doesn't go through the output filters, it doesn't go through the input filters. Um, so it depends on who you're using for the sidecars as well. Um, I do know that we've, and, and I don't know if PMs actually stuck anything out 
publicly, but I know that they're testing and finding that um, seriously depends on who you use. Um, so like Nginx uh, adds something like six milliseconds of latency per sidecar um, versus ours. I think they're, they're trying to put some numbers behind it, but I think they're looking at somewhere around one millisecond of latency. So it just depends. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the, the intricate details um, as to why, but I do know that they have done some testing and found, uh, found performance differences. Um, so a little bit about the Citrix side of things. Uh, Citrix is part of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation um, and they're really focused on uh, architecture flexibility. So you've seen that we plug into all of these different architectures. Um, they're, they're working on making sure that it's compatible with, uh, with all of the um, CNIs. So when you go through and deploy this in, uh, cloud, um, uh, in, in a cloud native or Kubernetes environment, um, we're, we're able to plug in everywhere. Um, working with the CNCF tools uh, is, is of critical importance to us. Uh, that's, I'd say that's really where they're focused right now is making sure that they plug in with things like Istio, Prometheus, Grafana, um, Spinnaker, Kayentha, all of those uh, across the board so that we can make sure that the tool sets that you're used to using is, let's be honest, this is all about cloud native compute um, and open source and everybody has jumped, I think the industry has kind of jumped down, down that rabbit hole. So if we're not playing nice with those, we're not, we're not playing. Um, and of course, perform performance and scale, um, you know, we've been in this game for a while. Uh, with NetScaler, I, yeah, I don't even remember how old, <laughs> how long they've been at it, but it's something like, I say it's like 20 years. Um, and so they've, they do have the, the performance behind it. They've always done things software first. Um, and then of course, API security and actionable insights, all of this aggregated through, um, through our ADM, which is the platform that's, that's managing all of this. So we're going to look at this through, um, and I know everybody has their single pane of glass. So like, yeah, some of it will be aggregated there and managed, but also we have all the platforms covered. So we've got VPX, which is a virtualized net scaler, CPX, which is the containerized platform. Um, SDX, which puts it on hardware. So you've got plenty of uh, VPXs sliced up into one piece of hardware. MPX is one instance of a NetScaler running on, on a single piece of hardware. And recently they announced that we can actually install this on a Linux kernel, on bare metal. So literally anything running uh, Linux on an x86 processor can run this. I tried to put it on a Raspberry Pi and rapidly found out that you can't do that. <laughs> uh, it is an RPM package and apparently you can tag RPM packages as x86 only and I was unaware of that before jumping down the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> I've learned my lesson. Um, I also got some crap from some other engineers about why would you want to put a Netscaler on a Raspberry Pi? Because I can. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, why? Yeah. Why? Why wouldn't I? It's based around a processor. It's not even meant to be a processor in the system. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't I? Come on, because it's sitting there begging me to do stupid things with it. Right. Um, I actually think it would have fit uh, resource-wise. It would have run, um, especially if I had taken out. So when they package the VLX, they actually package it so that you can install just like the Netscaler packet engine with no GUI, no WAF, no like, so you can do just load balancing with it or you can install like the whole thing and install the GUI and all, you know, all the packages you want. Is that packet engine um, I believe it is. Um, yeah, so I, I did run it up the food chain and was like, so can we do this on an ARM processor? And I still got, We'll, we'll look at it, but I think it's going to take a lot of dev work. Actually, where, where I think the dev work comes in is um, the, uh, the abstraction layer that they use for, uh, for the network interface. Um, and where they tie into that is um, the uh, DNF? 
Is that right? That's a, no, um, package thing. Okay. No. It, My immediate gut just goes S R I O V, but that's completely out. No, yeah, it was. It's something that. Um, no. Yeah, it, it was some piece for Linux that kind of abstracts some of the uh, the Nix, and it supports uh, Intel and uh, AMD only. Um, so it only supports x86 stuff, mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of it's built on top of that, from my understanding. Um, that was about all the answers, or at least that was me piecing some of the answers together too. So don't hold me to that being 100% accurate. Um, but uh, yeah, no. Moral of the story: can't put it on a Raspberry Pi. Can't put it on an ARM. Uh, I thought it'd be really cool to put it in an A series uh, um, VM instance. In um, Next time. I said A series, <laughs> not A series. Anyway, thanks, Siri. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it'd be fun to run up there in, in AWS in a, uh, in a in a tiny little A series, but, but no, not. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so. Moving on, uh, yeah. So these are pretty much all of the guys that we that we work with in the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, so Prometheus, Grafana, Helm, all of this has been validated. Uh, the CNIs that we interface with, um, here. Uh, what's that? EMD. Oh, search fluentd. Yes. There you go. Um, that makes sense why I couldn't remember which one product it was, because it's three. Um, and of course, Istio tying all of these guys together. We've recently become uh, OpenShift certified as well. Um, so OpenShift will actually support uh, Citrix ADC in their environment. Um, I should call out that it's not the latest version of OpenShift that it's supported, because I think they just recently came out with um, what was that, like 3.1? Uh, no, it was like 4.1 that just recently came out, and we haven't certified on that yet. But the, the older, like 3.14 was the last big build for OpenShift. Um, anywho, uh, they're getting there. Um, top 10, three, 10 reasons for Citrix Cloud Native would be you know, transitioning architecture choices as you go through. Like we talked about, there's really easy ways to get started on this, but you're gonna have to be able to migrate across the board uh, through these different architectures easily. Um, one common code base, I mentioned that earlier as well. This is all built on literally the exact same code base is running through all of these ADCs, so you don't have to worry about, you know, is it, um, is it built to run as a VM? Is it going to behave differently because it's in a container? Is it going to behave differently because it's on bare metal? It's not. It's literally all the same code base, all the same APIs driving it. Um, I, I should call out our APIs as well. There's a lot of development going on for, um, for stateful APIs. So traditionally, our APIs were very much um, declarative, right? Where you'd, you'd say, hey, I want to create a, uh, a server and I want to add it to a service group that now needs to be bound to a load balancer and so on and so forth and kind of climb up the chain. And you had like four or five different API calls you needed to make that happen. Um, with a lot of this rapid deployment that's happening, uh, you can see where that, that could become a problem if you're making, you know, 1800 changes an hour. Um, now all of a sudden you have a lot of API calls going on that take time. So if you do stateful API calls, um, you can reduce that uh, to where that it just declares, hey, I need all of this in one API call um, and, uh, and build that out. I think they were um, recently saying something like 900 times better performance in our Nitro API calls because of that. Um, so. Um, yeah, out of the uh, out of the box integration with CNCF tools, small uh, memory uh, footprint, um, and then higher performance and scale. Um, yeah, integrated layer layer four and seven security. This is actually kind of nice um, because you don't have to worry about setting up different policies across the board, right? You've got the same policies being deployed um, regardless of, uh, of where in the stack it is whenever you're making those architecture changes. 
um, service graph and observability, this is all inside of our uh, ADM platform. So you're piping all of that information up. It's showing you um, what your services look like and who's performing well uh, and where they are. Right? Now you can also start pulling that information together uh, geographically and which data centers are performing well, uh, what their health looks like. Um, and then of course, automated deployments and uh, for Canary and continuous deployment and delivery. Um, single pane of glass. Flexible licensing model. This is something that actually came out uh, about two years ago um, called pooled licensing that they're doing. You basically just buy one of two things. You either buy uh, just vCPU licensing um, or you buy um, bandwidth and instances. Uh, so you just have this pool and you can ship it literally anywhere. You want to keep it on-prem, you deploy those licenses on-prem, you decide to move those instances of Citrix ADC up into the cloud, you ship those licenses up to the cloud. You decommission what's, what's on-prem and you ship it up to the cloud. Uh, no repurchasing anything, like it's literally the exact same license, you just ship it to a new data center. Um, the license, not the actual ADC. <laughs> um, and then of course, we're able to help out with uh, diverse stakeholder needs. Right? So with that, uh, thank you guys. And any questions? When did you stop calling them load managers? Uh, <laughs> that's a funny question. Um, because <laughs> Citrix, I think, has always wanted to call them ADCs. Um, Gartner called them ADCs for quite a while. Um, Citrix recently renamed their stuff from Netscaler to Citrix ADC. Yeah, uh, I'm still being recorded, so this is fun. Um, <laughs> you just won't tell my marketing, my displeasure with that. Um, because everybody knows what a net scaler is, and to your point, why do we call it an ADC? Because uh, it's an application delivery controller. I, yeah, it's a proxy, it's a load balancer. The modern load balancer does a lot more. Yes. To be true. There's, I mean, especially inside, I mean, your traditional ADCs is, you know, whether it's Citrix or our competitors, they do things like, you know, WAF, they do things like IP reputation, they do forward proxy, they do, you know, all, like. They do a lot of things that you wouldn't expect. Right. Um, and I, I guess really kind of the goal of that is that you offload that from your application, right? Um, your developers don't want to have to write a WAF every time. And to be fair, I don't think security trusts them to write their WAF into their application. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of pieces involved there. Um, also authentication, especially in a microservices world. If you think about authentication, you're talking about services that are spinning up and dying on a regular basis. Now it becomes somewhat of a, a challenge to keep track of who's authenticated where. Uh, if you do that at the ADC level, now you don't care who's who lives and dies in the back end. You authenticate and handle like SAML and OAuth up the uh, at, at the load balancer level. So then, then you're able to to trust them from there. So to your point, yeah, they don't just load balance, but everybody knows them as load balancers. So uh, it's a fair question. Other questions? I actually managed to ramble on for 49 minutes. Look at me go. <laughs>